wish I am in you Father, we're singing this morning because you have redeemed us. You have sent your son into this world to rescue us from hell, to forgive us of our sins, to, to lift us up out of the pit and give us new life. And this morning we praise you. And Lord, we want to praise you each and every moment, each and every day, all the way until our last breath. But God, you know that so often uh, we're not praising you, but we're complaining about what you've done. We're asking for things that we want rather than things that will honor you. And God, forgive us. And today we simply invite you to, to change us body, soul, mind, and strength. Let us see differently. Let us speak differently. Let us, let us experience you on a whole new level as we yield our lives to you and invite your truth into us. So Father, speak now as we open your word. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite you to take your Bible or uh, your Bible app and turn to the book of Nehemiah. Some of you didn't even know Nehemiah was a book in the Bible, and that's cool. Uh, if, uh, it's really easy to find if you have a Bible app because, you know, those things just, you pull them up and the, the book is right there and you can just find it and scroll down, all that kind of stuff. But uh, if you're using a, a Bible from the pew that looks like this because you didn't bring one with you, it's page 503. So I'll help you find it. Some of you are like, I'm using one of those pew Bibles anyway, because now I know where it is. Uh, hey, have you ever traveled with children? Anyone? Such a delight, isn't it? Such an experience. There's, there's nothing quite like traveling with kids. And, uh, and, and there is a, a, apparently something they teach them at an early age, someplace that I've never been, that uh, all the children ask the same question when you're in the car, right? Do you guys know that question? Yeah, are we there yet? See, that your kids went to the same school mine did. I don't know. And, and, and they get trained to do this. And, and, and because I'm an annoying person, I just came up with an answer for them. And, uh, uh, you know, because I'd say, yes, we're there while we're still driving. And, and they'd go, how much longer? Five minutes. It's always five minutes. That was the only answer I ever gave them for years. Became a standing joke until you actually got close. Right? Because when you start getting close, you know, if, if your kids are like mine, their shoes are off, their stuff is scattered all over the back seat. And, and I would say, hey, put your shoes on, get ready, because we're almost there. Right? Because when you hit the parking lot at Disneyland, you do not want to be trying to find a shoe in the car. Right? You want to make a break for the gate. And so you're like, we're almost there. Get ready, because we're going to be there in a few minutes. And, and uh, today we're kind of launching into a new series called The Project. And uh, we're looking at Nehemiah because his is a story about an immense project that he took on and, and accomplished before God. And, uh, and we're talking about our Sweetwater project, uh, the new building that uh, we're going to be starting soon because we're almost there. Uh, Eleven years ago, we bought the property on Sweetwater and... Uh, it was so funny because we, we had two worship services. We couldn't imagine having more than two on a weekend. And so we bought this piece of property. Uh, and if you don't know where it is that we own, it's uh, directly across the highway from Dairy Queen. Easy way to find it. Uh, over on Sweetwater Drive. And, and, uh, and so we bought this piece of property. And for 11 years, people have been asking, are we there yet? And uh, the answer has always been five more minutes, okay? Because <laughs> we weren't even close. Except now it's time to put your shoes on because we're almost there. And uh, let me just give you a, a... Hey, truthfully, a year ago when I planned out the sermon series, uh, I was hoping that we'd be there. Uh, but, uh, but here's where we are in the, the building project, the, the Sweetwater Crossing building project. The plans are before the city. The architects finished with the plans, got them into the city. That looks like it's going smoothly. Uh, no problems there. Uh, the general contractors are bidding on the job, and, uh, and so there were, there were a bunch of them. And, and since I don't go to those things because I don't understand construction, I can identify a hammer three out of four times. And, uh, 
And so uh, they tell me, but, but so I put it in sports terms, you know, they've like had the first round of elimination and now they're to the semifinals. Uh, and so they'll have a general contractor probably by the end of this month. And, and uh, they're negotiating with Unisource because they've got these power poles right in the middle of the property and they're not exactly where they're supposed to be. And so we've got to move those and, and uh, working on a win-win there. And we're, we're looking at construction actually beginning sometime in November. And so we're almost there. And that's kind of cool. Uh, when I say almost there, I mean almost the beginning of that, that uh, journey of building. So I wanted you to know where we were in the building process because the next few weeks we're going to be looking at the book of Nehemiah, which is a story of building. So let me tell you a little bit about Nehemiah. Because uh, uh, unless you are steeped in, in Sunday school lessons, he wasn't even like a top 20 Sunday school lesson kind of guy. I mean, he's, he's a little bit obscure. But here's a story, cool story. In 587 B.C., the Babylonian Empire destroyed Jerusalem. Okay, Jerusalem was the capital of, of the southern uh, kingdom or called the kingdom of Judah. And, and uh, it was the capital of Israel. And so they, they, it was destroyed. I mean, they tore down the walls. They destroyed the temple. Uh, they carried into exile all of the leaders. So if you were a business leader or a political leader or a military leader or a religious leader, they took you and your family and hauled you off a thousand miles away and forced you to live in a new place. And so they left the city desolate in ruins and with just a remnant of people who were uh, living in the rubble, literally. And so they... Uh, uh, Babylon carried him into exile, and about 70 years later, the Persian Empire destroyed Babylon. And so they had a new king and a new empire, and the new king said, hey, you guys can go home if you want to, to all the Israelites. You can go home if you want to. And a bunch of them went back, and they built the temple again, and, and they started living there. Uh, but a lot of them stayed where they were because they had, you know, built lives, and they were second-generation people. They were living there. They were born there. And one of those people was Nehemiah. Nehemiah was born in uh, the faraway land, Babylon, Persia, someplace in there. And he had risen to a place of prominence in the court of the king of Persia. King Artaxerxes was his name. Uh, you know, and this is, this is historical stuff that, that existed. So we can actually go back and validate this, not just biblically, but historically. King Artaxerxes said, you guys go home. But, but Nehemiah was the cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. Now, we don't have the job cupbearer so much anymore in today's world. But uh, let me tell you what it is. A cupbearer was the guy who tasted the wine before the king drank it to make sure it wasn't poisoned. Cool job, right? So the closest parallel to it now is Secret Service working for the president. You know, because the other guys take the bullet for him. Well, he was the guy to take the poison for the king. And, and so the cupbearer had to be extremely trusted. All the king's court was extremely trusted because they had to protect the king from people who wanted to kill him. And usually those people who were cupbearers and stuff like that, they were usually foreigners because they couldn't be people who could take over the throne. They could inherit the throne. So the king surrounded himself with people that he trusted that were usually not of the, you know, they weren't Persians. And, and so their interests lied in protecting the king. That's who Nehemiah was. He was living in the lap of luxury in the palace of the king of the most powerful nation in the world at the time. And then where the story picks up in Nehemiah chapter 1, Nehemiah received tragic news. Follow with me if you will. Nehemiah 1.1. 1, 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Chislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the citadel, that's the capital of Persia, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. Now this is tragic news because walls to a city in that day and time were its security and were its status. Without walls, you were not a real city. And, and uh, since we don't have walled cities and walls haven't meant anything for you know, a thousand years or so, here, here's the equivalent. Jerusalem had been a real city, the capital of a kingdom. It, it was the center of activity, and, and it had all the stuff of a real city, and then that was taken away, and now it was just a pile of rocks. And people living there were not safe, they were not secure, they were troubled, and they were shamed. It, it's kind of like, you know what a real city is today, right? When we go to real cities, we know what they are, but there's two things that every real city has. This is the Chad Garrison School of Thought, so you can see if you agree with me. First of all, a real city has a real airport, right? 
Because real city is where we, where we drive to to fly out of because you don't want to have to catch the little puddle jumper that just goes to the real airport. And so a real city's got a real airport, and a real city has major sports teams, <laughs> right? I'm not talking about class, you know, double A or anything. I'm talking about they have professional sports teams, and we all know that. And some, you know, cities that are kind of borderline may have a sports team or two, but all the real cities have professional teams. Well, Jerusalem had been a real city. Now it wasn't. It, it was broken. And this was tragic news. The people were in distress. And then we see that Nehemiah had compassion for his city and his people. Continue on, because here's, here's Nehemiah's response to this news. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today. And grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now I was cupbearer to the king. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. Seems, seems like he's really with us there. <laughs> so it, we'll pray it's not going to last for days. Uh, you see, Nehemiah had compassion for his city and his people. And you see that in his weeping and his mourning. He's broken hearted for the people because... because they're, they're, they're scattered, they're shattered, they're, they're hopeless, they're in a tragic place. And his compassion moved him to do something. It, it moved him to do something. He desperately desired to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And by the way, just to give away the ending of the story, he does that. that that's what Nehemiah is all about. It's about his story, his actions of how he has this burden on his heart and he makes it come to reality and accomplishes it. And so he, he wants to be re rebuild the walls, but his journey began with a broken heart. He cared for the people and the city that he loved. And then, because he cared, ultimately, he reordered his life. Nehemiah reordered his life. You see it again. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Verse 4. He prayed and he fasted and he changed his routine. He gave up his habits. He gave up his comfort. Why? Why did he do that? Why did he make those sacrifices, those changes? Because he wanted to accomplish something great. And he knew that he needed God to be involved in it. And so he reordered his life and said, God, change me so that you can use me to make a difference. So that you can do something for your people. Now, that's kind of the, the first chapter of Nehemiah. What does that have to do with us? Well, let's talk about Calvary for a moment. I want you to hear some good news. Not the tragic news, but some good news. I told you that 11 years ago we bought Sweetwater property. Uh, church was running about uh, 530 in 2003. We were filling up two services, and we thought, oh, my goodness, we, we can't grow past two services. There's no way. I want you to know we could not even imagine five services on a weekend. Okay? It never occurred to us that we could do that. And, and so we said, well, we better buy this property or find property to buy. We put a bid in on that, that piece of property on Sweetwater. Somebody else had already bid on it. So we put, submitted a contract to be in second position, and the first you know, contract fell through, and we got the contract. And, and the person selling it thought that we're a church. We'll never come up with that kind of money. And there were people in the church who left the church because they said, oh, you'll never be able to pay for that. Uh, you're just throwing money away. We're not going to be a part of that. And, and so uh, here we are 11 years later, and the property's paid for, and the church is paid for, and uh, we're almost there. 
And, and so uh, now in 2014, uh, our average attendance this year, even through the heat of summer, has been over 1,250 people in five services on a weekend. Yeah. Couldn't imagine that. Couldn't see that happen. Last church year, our church year is July through June, uh, in case you're curious about that. But uh, our ch last church year, we baptized 85 people who confessed their faith in Jesus Christ. That's, that's something to celebrate. And then uh, this year, this church year since July, so two and a half months, we've baptized over 40 people uh, just since July. So God is doing some incredible things. Here's a, here's a couple other crazy stats that uh, surprised me, so they may surprise you too. Uh, Calvary is in the top 1% of churches in the United States of America. Isn't that wild? I mean, who would have thunk it? And then uh, in Arizona, we're the, we're the third largest Southern Baptist church, uh, period. Uh, I mean, out here in Lake Havasu City, in the middle of nowhere, in our little town. You see, God's doing amazing things at Calvary, and you're a part of that. You're, you're the reason for that. And, and here's, you know, that's the good news, which kind of begs the question, well, then why do we need to build? Well, the reason that we're building is because of compassion for our city and our people. Compassion for our city and our people. See, Calvary exists to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ through the love of his people and the power of his truth. I mean, that's why we do what we do. That's, that's our motivation. That's our fuel. That's our, our driving force behind all of our decisions is because we want to see people come to faith in Jesus Christ. And so we're going to build a building on Sweetwater, not because we can. Hey, we're a big church. We need to have a big building. Let's do it. We're, we're not building a building to have one big worship service. You know, a lot of churches do that. Ah, oh, let's build one so that everybody can be together and we'll have one big worship service and, and anymore, one, one service on a weekend just seems lazy to me. Uh, <laughs> just saying it, it's weird. Uh, we're not building on Sweetwater as a monument to our success or as a monument to our pastor's ego. Uh, look, the uh, office with the hot tub and the soda fountain, <laughs> we're not building that in phase one, okay? It's not happening. We're not building any offices in the new building because that's not going to help us lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. I'm going to have the same office I've had for the last 15 years. Uh, we're building on Sweetwater. Hear this. This is the reason. Because in Lake Havasu City, there are between 35 and 40,000 people who are unchurched. 35 to 40,000 people who need to experience a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. And so the reason that we're going to build is because there's not room for them here. And so we got to expand. we got to do something so that we can have a chance to lead them into this life-changing relationship with Jesus. I mean, uh, me personally, our ministry staff, our leaders here at Calvary, I have hearts that are broken for the people who need a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's why when we complete the building, we still plan to have at least four worship services. At least four. We're going to have Saturday service. We're going to have three on Sunday uh, to start with. Because I'm not going to say that's all we're going to do anymore. Uh, that's where we're going to begin. Because 35 to 40,000 people is significant. And, and, and we, you know what? Our friends, our neighbors, our coworkers, our relatives are the people who need a life-changing relationship with Jesus. The people that you hang out with at your kids' soccer games and at their gymnastics meets and that your kids go to school with and you see in the, in the stores, they need a place to meet Jesus Christ. And so my prayer today is that you would see our city. It, its morals are broken down. It, the people are living in fear. Families are struggling and shattered. And, and I pray that your heart is filled with compassion and that you desperately want them to experience that life-altering, hope-giving relationship with the Son of God. And if you're here today and your life is shattered and you're the one who's desperate and you need hope and you need life, then you've come to the right place. Because you're not going to find condemnation here, but compassion. Because we want God to heal your life we want you to experience the forgiveness of sins. We want you to know that God can change you. 
Because most of us in this room have already experienced that life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. And by that I mean that we believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. We believe that he died on the cross to pay for our sins. That he was raised from the dead. And we've made a commitment to follow Jesus with our life. And if you're here today and you're praying, God, put my life back together. God, give me hope, restore me. It begins with that relationship with Jesus. He's the one who can change you. He's the one who can heal you. And if you've never taken that step, then I pray that today you would take that step because that's the whole reason this place exists is to lead people to Jesus. So I pray today that you'll have compassion that will move you to change your life so that God will accomplish great things in you and in our city. Which brings me to a question. Will you reorder your life? You see, Nehemiah, his compassion drove him to reorder his life. To reschedule, reprioritize, revalue his activities and his commitments. Literally, his compassion changed his life. I mean, I already told you, he was living in the lap of luxury. He, he was there, he had job security, he had uh, uh, people around him who knew him, who cared for him. The king knew him and cared for him. And he was willing, because of his compassion for his people and his city, to change what he was doing so that God could use him to make a difference in God's people. Will you reorder your life Will you join us on this journey of compassion? Uh, now, here's the thing. Every church I've ever been in, the people all agree, oh, yeah, we want to see the unchurched come into our church. We want to reach our community. We want to see people experience this relationship with Jesus Christ. We want them to have salvation. We want them to know that heaven is their destiny. Every church I've ever talked to, and I, and I talk to lots of churches, lots of pastors, and here's the problem. And it's a problem for the church, and it's a problem for the church people. And that is this, we say that we have compassion, but we don't have enough compassion to change our lives. And so churches say, we want to reach our community, we want, to, we want the people to come here, but they don't change anything about their church. They won't give up their music, they won't give up their schedule, they won't change their times, they won't change their activities, they don't want to share their space. And so they say they have compassion, and they get all teary about it, all these poor people But they don't do anything differently. Like Nehemiah could have done, they stay back with the king in their lap of luxury and their comfort and they say, hey, I hope somebody will go and build their walls. And what I'm asking you today, as followers of Jesus Christ, will you allow God to reorder your life so that he can reach the people of this community? Because you care more for them than for yourself. What does that look like? I'm going to ask you to do a, a few things. I'm going to ask you to consider a few things. For, for, to begin with, I'm going to ask you if you'll pray and fast for the project. The project. We're talking about the Sweetwater Project, building the new building. Will you pray and fast for the project? Because Nehemiah began by praying and fasting before the Lord. So let me get real specific. I'm going to challenge every single person in this congregation to go and pray on the property at least one time between now and when they break ground. Because once they break ground, you can't wander the property like you can right now. They're going to put fences up and there'll be places you can't go and stuff like that. We've got a prayer path on the property that you can go from kind of station to station and there's scripture and kind of directions to, you know, if you don't know how to pray, uh, then you can literally walk that and read the thing and go, okay, here's what I can do. One time. Take your kids. It's a, it's a fun thing. They can walk along. You guys can stop. You can pray as a family. Have your kids pray. Pray for what? Pray for the contractors. Pray for the city inspectors. Pray for the safety of the workers. Pray for the resources that God would provide. Pray for the lost of Lake Havasu City, your friends, your neighbors that need Jesus. Pray for them. Pray that God would change your life to bless you. A- ask all those things. But one time. Now, some of you may be down there once a month. Some of you may be down there once a week. Some of you may be down there every day because you have the time to do that. Praise God. But I'm, just, I'm challenging everybody to do it at least once. Will you pray at least once on the property? Now, you can't walk the property because it's, you know, it's about a quarter-mile walk around there. You can't walk the property? Fine. Drive onto the property if, where the cross is. You guys know where the cross is, right? Giant cross. You can see it from the highway. 
Drive onto the property. It's just dirt. You're not going to hurt anything. Get out of your car. Sit on the bench and pray for an hour. Okay? Making it easy for you. That's the challenge. One, fasting. I don't know if you've ever fasted or not, but this is, a, a, again, reordering your life. It's upsetting your life. It's giving up food for a meal or a day, saying, God, we really want you to do something special in my life and through my life in this community. I want you to, I want you to touch 35 to 40,000 lives, and I want to be a part of that. And, and uh, one time between now and when we break ground, sometime in November. So you got between six and ten weeks. And, uh, and it might just be a lunchtime. You're going to hang and skip lunch, and I'm going to do that, and I'm going to pray. And, I, and I'm going to go to the property, and I'll walk it, and I'll do it, give it up. However you want to do it, just, just try it. Now, some of you may fast more. Some of you may fast, you know, uh, once a month or once a week. Uh, however God leads you, I'm fine with that. That's just a challenge. One time. Pray and fast. Will you volunteer? Will you serve? This is the second challenge. Now, a lot of you are already serving. Calvary is, is a church that is built on its volunteers. People serve all over the place around here, and it's awesome to see that. But uh, here's the thing. We need more people to serve. We need more volunteers. Whether you've got one hour a month to give or eight hours a day, we could use you. Now, maybe you want to you know, help with the actual building project. You've got skills. You've got trades. You're, you're experienced. Maybe you just want to go down there and help clean up and, and help out. Then, then contact Mike Kimball. He's, he's our business manager. He's in charge of the project. He, you know, he'd love to use you. Some of you are already doing that. That is awesome. Others of you can, and you'd like to. That's perfect. But here's the thing. A lot of you are like me, and you're not really adept at construction, and they, you, know, you help better by staying away. Uh, there's other ways for you to serve. Because here's what's going to happen. Right now, we have compassion for our people. And God is blessing Calvary. He's doing amazing things through the ministry of Calvary. And lives are being changed. And we're celebrating that. We talked about that. You were applauding that a little while ago. If we continue to be faithful, if we continue to have compassion for people, what's God going to do? He's going to send us more people. See, that's how he does. If you're faithful with a few, God gives you more. And, and so we're, we're not going to stop seeing people come as long as we have compassion for this city and for the people in this city. And, and, and so God's going to send us more people when we occupy the building. And we need to be ready for that day. And so we need volunteers. We need to get ready before that day happens. So we need volunteers now. Let me just tell you some of the areas we could use your help. We need people to be greeters. You know, say hi to people when they walk in the door, hand them a bulletin, smile, open doors for them, all that kind of stuff. We need greeters. If you are friendly and you like people and you can show up on time, you qualify to be a greeter. Okay, some of you might have to reorder your life to show up on time. I get that. But, uh, but you know, if you're mean and nasty and you don't like people, don't volunteer to be a greeter, please. <laughs> we hate having to fire volunteers. <laughs> but we'll do it. Okay, but there are so many of you, because I know I tell you, you just, you love people and you're smiling, and you know, hey, just volunteer, help out. Again, information is in the bullets. It's on the backside of your sermon notes. There's a whole list of people to contact for different areas to serve. Take those home and, and figure out where you want to serve. We need nursery workers. Hey, we have, this is great news, we have over 170 kids showing up on a weekend. Is that awesome or what? Yeah. And, and it's so funny because we go, oh, we love children. And people go, oh, I love kids. We work in the nursery. Heck no. <laughs> oh, so do you really love kids? Or is that just like you, a badge you wear, you know, to kind of say that you love kids? Hey, we need people to work in the nursery. Just, you know, once a quarter, once a month. And here's the cool thing at Calvary. There's five services. You don't have to miss yours. Just saying. You know, children and student ministry assistants, you want to help Miss Julie or OC volunteer? We need sound and tech people. Let me just be real blunt. There are some of you that have the gift to, to hear sound and to, you're not freaked out by making decisions at that moment. Some of you already know how to run sound boards and stuff like that, and you're just sitting there going, they should do a better job. Volunteer. We're going to have all new equipment in the new building. We need people who, who are learning and growing and, and getting trained in it. And, and you're saying, well, I can't do sound. There's, that's way too complex for me. Oh, yeah? How about computer? Because if you've got a finger and you can pay attention, you qualify. <laughs> okay? Button. 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 Got it? I mean, you know, just sing along with the songs and change them. You're, you're qualified. You can do this. Again, contact Jesse if you're interested in that. Speaking of Jesse, we need musicians. 
Yeah, you know, not only do we have five services on the weekend, we have choirs, we have Celebrate Recovery, we have chapel. We, you know, you got talent and you're like, oh, maybe I'm not good enough. Number one, let us decide. And two, I'm serious, let us decide. And then two, you know, plug in and see where you can be used by God. We've got auditions this week, and there's packets back at the Connection Center. Pick some up on the way out. Hey, we need life group leaders and hosts. This was supposed to be the second big weekend for life group signups. You know why we're not talking about life groups? Because we don't have any room in life groups. Now, that's a good thing, but it's not. And here's the deal. Here's what I know. I know there are life group leaders who are not involved in life groups because you've led groups before, and you're like, I'm going to take a break for a while. And we need you. We need you to step up and say, hey, I'll host a group. Hey, I'll lead a group. Uh, and uh, you need to talk to Pastor Chet, like, soon. So shoot him an email and just say, yeah, I, God tells telling me I need to maybe do a, a life group thing. Because if God sends us more people, we need to teach more people. We need parking lot attendants. By the way, that's where the mean people can serve. Uh, <laughs> they're not mean out there. I know that. But you can, hey, park here. Don't go there. It just works. So I got one more thing I got to challenge this, this service with. Something you can do that will reorder your life that will help make a difference in the lives of others. Uh, and, and you guys have heard me say this, and I'm going to keep saying this. We have more room on Saturday than we do on Sunday morning. Our 930 and 11 services are full. And, and you know that because you try to get in here. And you know how difficult the parking is. You know how crowded the seating is. Uh, you know that if you don't get here early, someone else is going to sit in your seat, and you don't like that. Uh, <laughs> some of you, it's not going to be difficult, but you can reorder your life enough to come and worship on Saturday with us. Same sermon, same music, same kid stuff. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's identical. What we do in one service, we do in all the services. And so I'm just going to, encourage, again, encourage about 50 of you to really seek God and say, do I need to come? Do our family need to come on Saturdays? Because we can. And we'll open up space for more people to come because this is the time when most people who are unchurched come to church. One last thing that all of you can do. If you have compassion for the city, it'll, you'll, you'll be moved to do this. And it's simple. It's the simplest thing of all. Invite your friends. Invite your neighbors. Invite your coworkers. 35 to 40,000 unchurched people in Lake Havasu City means that the majority of the people that you meet, that you do business with, that you hang out with, don't have a church home. I'm not saying they're not religious. I'm not even saying they're not necessarily believers. But right now, they're unconnected to a place where they can study, serve, grow, and celebrate the goodness of God. When was the last time that you said to a friend, to a neighbor, hey, what are you doing Sunday? Why don't we go to breakfast and go to church? Why don't you come meet my Savior? He's changed my life, and he can change yours. See, it's not that hard. If we are people of compassion for our city and for the people in our city. So are you willing to change your life to serve the God who changed your life? Do it for Lake Havasu City. Do it for Calvary. Do it for Christ. Because he gave his all for you. God is doing amazing things in this place. I pray that you will join us on this journey of compassion. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you. Thank you for the way that you have changed our lives, for you've given us hope, you've, you've given us salvation. And Lord, we don't deserve any of it, and yet we are thankful for every bit of it. And today we simply commit ourselves to you. We want to worship you, and we want to serve you with our lives. So speak into our lives, our hearts, our minds, and show us how we can reorder, reprioritize our lives for you. And God, we want to see you do something amazing and unbelievable to reach those 35 or 40,000 people in Lake Havasu City. We know it's not been done in America in a long, long time, but we're not afraid to ask you. God, you've already done more than I ever dreamed possible in this place. And we know that your grace is amazing. So we give ourselves, this church, and the city to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and worship our God together.